Mark chapter 15. Say amen when you got it. Gospel of Mark chapter 15 verses, and I'm going to take it up from verse 21 and end it at 24. So if you have your Bibles, say amen when you have it. Okay. A certain man from Cyrene, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing by on his way in from the country, and they forced him to carry the cross. Everybody say the cross. They brought Jesus to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. Then they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it, and they crucified him. Dividing up his clothes, they cast lots to see what each would get. Let's pray. Father, again, we thank you, Lord. We thank you for today. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for the unexpected. We don't know, again, what can happen or what may come our way. But, Father, we trust in you. And, Father, as we take a look at, at the unexpected, we pray that your Holy Spirit to minister to us this morning. The unexpected could be a tragedy. The unexpected could be your prompting, Lord Jesus. And, Father, we pray, Lord Jesus, that we would be prepared to seize this opportunity, Lord Jesus. Again, we pray, Lord Jesus, as you minister to us about this man, Simon, and some of the things that we can learn from the cross. Again, I pray that you hide me behind your precious cross this morning and then impart your truths. In Jesus' mighty name we pray and everybody says, Amen. 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 Go ahead and be seated. Again, what can we learn from the cross from this man named Simon? First of all, God shows you. Again, I, I'm thinking about this man, Simon, just about the last couple of weeks and asking God, why did you memorialize this guy and just give us a little bit about who this man was? But it's, it's very important when we think about this man because, again, some commentaries, when I say commentaries, these are people that have their interpretation of what the witnesses were trying to convey to the people of God, or those that would have read, uh, read the Gospels. And when we think about this individual, Simon, did he carry the physical cross of Jesus? And of course, we know that he was told, take up his cross. So again, here's that question. And we know this phrase because we use it all the time. Was Simon in the wrong place at the wrong time? You think about that. This is just a part of his bucket list. I'm in Jerusalem. I'm, I'm experiencing the Passover. I could check that off. I see a massive crowd coming my way. And of course, in my curiosity, I bust through the crowd. And then, is it a, a coincidence? I'd say no. Because we don't believe in coincidence. We believe that this was God ordained. Because God had his way in Simon's life. And he happened to be at the right place just at the right time. An unexpected, unexpected assignment took place. And he was instructed, literally commanded, to pick up Jesus' cross. So. It says there in John 15, 16, it says, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. God chose us. And see, some of us think that when we came here, now, some of us have this impression that when we came to Jesus Christ, that we came to Jesus. Some of us have this weird understanding that that. I had something to do with me or yourself coming to Jesus. But let's, let's make something really clear. God chose you. And again, you could have probably been saying that we use testimonies all the time. I have a testimony. 
your initial testimony, my initial testimony is how I came to know Jesus. We're always going to have a continual testimony of the life we have in Christ Jesus. Testimonies that were shared today. To God be all the glory. But we'll always have, when somebody says, do you have a testimony? They're talking about how you came to know the Lord. And so when we think about this man, Simon, the Bible tells us that God has appointed us to bear fruit, fruit that will last. And again, I, I've shared with you that somehow, when I think about this man named Simon, God made an impact in his life because God chose him to be there at that particular moment. And it didn't matter. Again, when we think about Simon, was he going there to have a good time? Of course he was going there to have a good time. Was he planning to go there so that he could participate in the Passover? Of course he was planning to participate in the Passover. Little did he know God had a bigger plan for his life. And that bigger plan was as Simon, as I was starting to read this and study this, he took up Jesus' cross, this cross member, and I'm going to go with that. And I had nothing to do with this, and I'm thinking, I'm playing Simon. He is literally carrying this beam on him, and now he's just a participant in the crowd. Now he becomes an unexpected individual within the procession, carrying the cross of a known supposedly criminal who shouldn't even be part of that procession. So he's carrying this. How do you think you would feel being a person of faith, all of a sudden been thrown into action, given an assignment to take up the cross of supposedly a known criminal? Everybody is seeing you now. Do they know that you were just an innocent bystander? Do they believe that you just happened to come there visiting from northern Africa? They don't even know who you are. All they know is that you have a cross beam on your shoulders so they will ridicule you. You're one of those individuals that's going to get crucified. They don't know that a Roman soldier grabbed your arm and said, take up his cross. And out of your fear, you can't say, no way. You listen to those guys. And so you know as you're going on to this procession, to the place they call the skull, you're going along and everybody is seeing you and hating on you, mocking you and spitting on you. And so are the Roman soldiers. And you can't get tired. You're not prepared for this action. And you're carrying something that shouldn't be on your shoulders. And I gotta be wondering, because the Bible doesn't even say these things, and we've seen pictures and movies on this. I gotta be wondering. As he's carrying this cross beam, and he's looking at Jesus, and Jesus is looking at his eyes, does he truly understand what God has done for him? And I believe this, and this is just my opinion. Did he carry Jesus' cross, the physical cross? Yes. But I believe this, the significant part of this it goes way beyond this. Because Jesus is trying to teach us through Simon that I bore the cross for each one of you. Amen. I chose you. And that's why when we come to church, and this is the significance of when God says, I chose you. You're here because God chose you. Let me say that again. You're here because God chose you. And because you're here, that's why when we, again, that's why we come to worship God. The Bible tells us, do not forsake the assembling of yourself. But we are to encourage one another as we see the day, and that day is capitalized, the D, approaching. We come to church because we worship God for who he is. We come to church because we worship God for what he's doing in our lives. And we come to church to worship him for what he's doing in the lives of the brethren. Amen? Amen? So when we come to church knowing all these things, it should be real easy for us to get into worship mode as soon as we step into the household of faith. Amen? Amen. I mean, again, I think about this week, 
In fact, can I say, I think about these last four months, and I, again, I was telling Brother Sean, I told God in my prayers the other night, you know what the word uncle is? You know when somebody's wrestling you, you're wrestling you, you say uncle, uncle. Well, today they use the word, they tap out, right? Well, when I was a kid, you said uncle. Well, I told God, uncle. You know, because a little time out, but God reminds us. God reminds us when we think about the difficulty that we feel we endure, right? It may be a difficulty for us. Let me say that. It's a difficulty for us that remain because we're still here. But though for those that have gone on to glory, for those that have graduated, those who have commenced to go to be with the Lord, they're heaven bound. They're in the presence of the Lord. They're excited. And again, I always think about this during this passage when we read about Jesus and the miraculous impact he made when he shocked the world to bring Lazarus from the grave. Again, I think I brought this up at one of those sermons when I talked about Lazarus. Lazarus had already been in the grave four days. And Jesus had, forgive me, Lord, but I, he had the nerve to bring him back. Do you ever think about that? I'm thinking if I'm in heaven rejoicing, all of a sudden I feel my, I'm being pulled. Right? I mean, do you ever think about that? And I mean, you know, again, God had a reason for that. God had a reason for that. God did that to shock the world, to let the people know that he is the resurrection and the life. Right. He that believes in him, though he die, will live. And it's something that when we, it's been a rough four months, but the thing is, when we as Christians recognize that God chose us, and he chose us that we, in the faith, know that when we graduate and commence to the other life, it's a greater life than this life. That's why we cry. That's why we grieve. That's why we need comfort. But those that have gone, to God be all the glory. Amen. To God be all the glory. Yeah. You know, it's hard for us to, get, to, to have any kind of understanding because God gives us a little glimpse about what heaven is going to be like. You know, I mean, again, one of the great writers uh, of the book Heaven, um, Randy Alcorn, he has this book, and he kind of gives us some insight about what heaven's going to be like. But right in the beginning of his book, as you read it, he almost says, God doesn't give us a lot of insight about heaven, but it would be like if you've never been to Disneyland. Anybody here never been to Disneyland? Can you hug her? <laughs> okay, we got to send her to Disneyland and her kids. But no, I'm just letting you know that. I mean, if you've never been to Disneyland and you get an opportunity to finally go through the gate, right? Again, I, it, it probably fails in comparison, but still, to actually get there. And when you finally get there, I remember the first time my mom and dad brought us there. I stood there, and I was so excited to be outside. I wasn't even in Disneyland. I was outside looking in, and I could see it. And I marveled at it. I couldn't wait to get in. I was already there. I was excited when we drove there. <laughs> Remember the old phrase in the car? 72 Dodge Matador, our, our, my dad's station wagon, with the wings, it was pink and white. Man, one of the greatest cars ever, right? <laughs> we finally got there, and I kept telling my dad, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Not my dad, I know I got it. So sick. But that's okay. And God is saying the same thing, and I know all of us are saying the same thing, because when we go through these difficult times, we always tell God, are we there yet? Are we there yet? And it's not yet. But God chose you. Amen? Amen. God chose you. And you are here chosen to bear fruit. Fruit. And that's the kind of fruit God wants. And the legacy that Simon left, and again, you read about this individual named Rufus in the book of Acts, and you read about, I don't know, some commentaries believe that Alexander, and they probably came uh, believers also, but the thing is, there is something about God choosing me 
And every time you come to worship, I want you to, if there's a point, I want you to, to grab hold of it. Every time you get ready to do worship here in the church, just remember that. God chose you. That would put you right into the singular act of saying, I got to worship him. I got to worship him. Amen? Amen? Secondly, what we can learn from the cross is that we need to take up our cross. Sometimes we think about this and we say, you know, <laughs> early on at Rough and Ready Island at our Bible study, this is part of a journey to discipleship. And I was trying to think about this, and I, and I got this flashback from back in the day in Rough and Ready, and I was actually studying this, and I remember to take up your cross. Now, Simon was told to take up his cross. And I'm looking at this, and Luke has this rendering, and he says in chapter 9, verse 23, now again, this passage is also written in all of uh, three of the Gospels, and this, this passage, when it talks about to take up your cross, Jesus knows that there, the multitudes are following him in his ministry. And when we read about this, the, the thing that makes an impact on us when we, he talks about take up your cross, people are following him for what they can get. People are there trying to say, oh, he's going to probably feed us. He's going to probably heal somebody. Maybe that healing is going to come to me. It's all about them. And Jesus makes this statement. And right away, he is now dividing and separating those that will be his disciples and those that are just basically there as Lukey Lewis. You know what Lukey Lewis, right? Okay. Somebody that's not really intended to be part of it. He says, then he said to all them all, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves Take up their cross, what does it say? Daily. 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 And follow me. So what is meant by to take up your cross? Not just to take up a cross. Is it a physical cross? I mean, you have to go up there and walk around with a physical cross every day. But there's something to me when we grab, grab hold of this teaching that I'm supposed to physically take up a spiritual cross. From the time I wake up, yes. While I'm working, yes. To take up your cross means to be in self-denial of your, basically of yourself. You're saying to God, I'm going to take up my cross because we are commanded to take up our cross. We are commanded to deny our desires, to deny our passions, to deny everything that we want in this life. Because think about this. Basic Christianity. When you said, Jesus Christ, come into my life, we said, be Savior first. Because we needed to be saved. We needed a Savior. But somehow we forget, and this is how Jesus is separating those that are looking loose and those that will be true disciples or true followers of his. He says, I will save you, but we're also saying, be Savior and Master. Lord. And we're telling God, as we are taking up our cross daily, I'm going to not only put away the sinful or carnal desires of my, of my past, because the Holy Spirit is coming into my life, but I'm also going to say, the things that I used to like to do, I won't do through the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to try not to do those, but I'm going to lean on the Holy Spirit to prohibit me, to stop me from doing those things. Again, used to have a foul mouth. Used to. Used to have a very short fuse. Somehow, the Holy Spirit in your life transforms you. And all of a sudden, that short temper is more controlled. That, that mouth gets under control. And then you're so far removed from that. Again, this is how sometimes I think I even find myself acting a little self-righteous. I don't cuss anymore. But when I'm around people that cuss, I kind of feel like, you got a potty mouth. I mean, you know what I'm saying? Well, because, but then God reminds me, you used to be 
that person. So I'm not so far removed from him. And I, I, I kind of catch myself and say, you self-righteous individual. I, I say that to myself because I used to be like him. And then I got to say, the same God that cleaned up this mouth can clean up his mouth. Amen? Amen? The thing is, over the years, the Holy Spirit, again, this is what it means to take up your cross. Over the years, through self-denial, I'm taking up my cross. I'm sacrificing various things in my life where I no longer want or desire. And I lean more on the Holy Spirit in my life. So some people think, well, that's why Christianity is sometimes looked upon and frowned upon because they go, I don't want to give up anything. You know? You know, you guys don't have, you don't have any fun. You, you guys don't have any fun. I'm looking at you guys. You don't have any fun. Christians, you just go to church and clap your hands and sing and that's it. You don't have any fun, right? It kind of reminds me when I was a Roman Catholic. You know, I used to think that nuns pretty much slept in all their wardrobe. That's how ignorant I was. I didn't know nuns go boating. I didn't know they went horseback riding and all that other stuff. You know, because I thought they were so pious. I figured, oh, they're not allowed to do any of those things, right? In other words, they gave up because they made this oath that they gave up life in general. But that's the way we're perceived too as Christians. You know, I mean, again, I know that Christianity and the different teachings has kind of put, uh, I guess, a stranglehold on we as Christians. It kind of thought that Christianity was the religion of do's and don'ts, right? Do's and don'ts, all right? And, and I, I, I think over the last 10 years, I, I kind of poked fun at some of you, and I'm, I'm looking at some of you guys that are, are part of that era, right? Again, you, you heard me kind of tell you guys over the years that what is the spiritual significance of taking a ball and then just, that was a strike by the way, right? <laughs> but what was the spiritual significance of you can't go bowling? Oh yeah, I'm not, I'm, again, respectfully I'm thinking, why couldn't you do that? Was it a, a racial thing because it was a black ball hitting white pins? I don't know. What was the spiritual significance of that? I don't understand. I know that they were teaching because it had to do with a certain image. And it had to do with, we didn't just want you to be out there. But I, you know, I'm thinking about that, and as I'm taking up my cross, I'm out there. And God has called me to be out there because, let me point out, the, the Phil Andrew, you're out there among sinners, right? Those of you that went out, and you're a part of that, you went out from these four walls, you were with sinners. Yeah. Non-believers. People that cussed. People that did drugs, drank. They were horrific people, right? But you went out there because God commands you to do this. And you know that you're going out there because you want to seize the opportunity you have taken up your cross in your sacrificial love for people that are in dire need of a Savior. And that's what the call of God is this morning when he's talking about take up your cross. Taking up your cross to go out and in spite of some of the heartache and the suffering and the trials that you may endure by doing this, someone is going to see your life and see it as a reflection of Jesus Christ. And they're going to want to have what you have. Amen. See, that's what this is all about. To take up your cross. Some people think that's some hardship. But God tells them, take my yoke upon you. For his yoke. His yoke is what? It's light. It's light. I don't know any Christian that once they were once an enemy of God, when they became Christians, I don't know anybody that ever has said, I don't like my life in Christ Jesus. I don't know anybody 
who has ever said, God has not provided for me. God has not saved me. God has not protected me. God has not redeemed me. I mean, the day you say, come into my life, it's a wonderful thing. It's not like a 90-day probationary period when you get a job where you have to go through some kind of orientation in order for you to hold that position. The day you said, Jesus, come into my life, it took place right there. Oh, come on, church. Yeah. It took place right there. Yeah. And right away, the Holy Spirit, I mean, you got to think, this is what they talk about, spiritual warfare, that there's this anticipation and there's this battle that is going on when you are getting ready to bow your head in submission to God. You had a former life, or you have a former life, and right away, the enemy is saying, don't do it, don't do it. And as you begin to bow your head, and all the angels in heaven are praying, and that person that is leading you down that path, till finally you say, forgive me for all my sins. Come into my life. And then the Bible says that all of heaven, as soon as you know, think about this, as soon as you say, come into my life, be Savior and Lord, the Bible says all of heaven rejoices. I mean, i got to be thinking now. I know I'm reaching here, but I have to be thinking because God knows everything. But I think God says, wait for it. Wait for it. And then when you say, because this has to be a profession of faith. You don't know what you're getting yourself into. But all you know is you don't want that other life. And you need Jesus. And as soon as you cross over and say, come into my life. All of heaven rejoices. I mean, we, we, we come to church and we keep thinking, well, nobody got saved today. But yes, many people got saved today. They're just not in this house today. They got saved in another church. They got saved in the jungle. They got, they got saved on the gutters of New York City. They got saved in the barrios of, of Brooklyn. They got saved somewhere in the body of Christ. Somebody got saved why we're excited. Amen? Amen. Take up your cross. This is what God wants us to do. So when you think about taking up your cross, I have this passage for you this morning. It says in Romans 5, and not, and not only that, but we also glory in tribulation, sufferings. Knowing that tribulation produces perseverance and perseverance character and character hope now, hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. So in other words, you're not alone. You're not alone. And every time you think you're alone, I remember when we used to always, my kids, we, we used to always get our Christmas tree. They don't remember this. We used to always go somewhere over here near on the east side of Lodi to go get our Christmas tree. Those were the good old days where dad would take the kids and we would go out and Sister Lou would always say, I want that big one. You're not carrying it. <laughs> <laughs> and we would all get our Christmas tree and we'd go out there and they'd give you this little token saw and of course you're going in the mud and, and this was our rite of passage, if you will, for our kids to go and grab it and I would even tell him, you know, I think it was Gab. You know Gab. She was a cutie, right? She would hold it. I said, honey, I'll help you. She'd go in there, and of course, I was letting her hold it. And of course, the blade was one of those blades that it cuts both ways. And the thing is, when I think about that, she probably thought when we said, timber, right? She probably, and I could just see her angelic face at that time, you know? <laughs> She just looked so amazed because she was able to chop that tree down, literally saw it down. And I think about that moment, but she didn't recognize that she didn't cut that tree down. Her dad that was helping her had the strength and the power to cut. Of course, using this, the tool, right? It's the same way when we think we're going through these tribulations. God did not leave us orphans. 
You don't go by the, you don't, you don't endure these things by yourself. And that's, that's where he talks about that this gift that was poured out. He has given us the Holy Spirit, the comforter, the advocate. The Holy Spirit in your life is helping you endure whatever sufferings or trials. And at the same time, as you go through these things, the Bible tells us in the book of James to count it or consider it pure joy when you go through these. Because you don't go through these by yourself. You have the Holy Spirit in you that enables you to get through this. Amen. And you know what else is? that Something that just came to me. The Holy Spirit is in you to help you endure this and get through this. But we're here too. Isn't that great? We're here with you. Amen. Our brother could testify to that. Our brother Jesse could testify to that. That's what the body of Christ is here for. Amen. We are the hands and the heart and the mouth and the ears of God. We are here to help you get through it. Amen. Amen. I said this at a memorial. It never says singular saint in the Bible. It's always saints. That's what it has to do with you cut you. It's hard being a Christian and not be part of a body. We are relational beings. That's why God wants us to be and stay together. It's a cool thing, being together, amen? I mean, what good is having a potluck by yourself? <laughs> right? You bring your own dish. You, come on, you were with that guy. Have to think about it. There's Pastor Ben up here, hey, we're having a potluck. I brought ginger beef. Nobody else is here. Just me. What, what good is that? Right? Nobody but the rice. And I, of course, I cooked it. It's probably going to taste great. Right? The thing is, how much more exciting is it when I can stand up here and say, we're having a potluck afterward. Everybody begins to salivate, right? Because we know there's some goodies back there, and we know that certain individuals here are gifted in cooking. Amen. And we know that that's what it's all about when we think about what God has called us to do. So we don't, we're not, when we take up our cross, the Holy Spirit is in us, and the body of Christ is with us. Amen? Amen. One more. One more. One more. Remember, I didn't get the pulpit till late. <laughs> an expression of love. So what can we learn from the cross? It's an expression of his love. Wow. To God be all the glory. Amen? So what was the significance of Simon taking up his, his cross, meaning Jesus' cross? Again, I, I, I think about that, and I, I kind of gave you a, a little tidbit about that earlier. I, I think about the physical attribute that here's Simon taking up on this cross beam. But God's reminding us this morning that the cross that maybe Simon physically carried, that Jesus carried the cross for all of us. And it says right there, but God demonstrated his own love for us in this. While you were still an unbeliever, an enemy of God, behaving in manners and ways that you shouldn't have been behaving, that somehow, some way, in God's great love, He died for you. And we think about this expression of love. How many other individuals would extend themselves to anybody else in that manner? God is that individual, and you know. When I, I think about the road, when Simon was carrying the cross and the, the eye contact that he was making with Jesus, did he quite under, understand what was taking place here? Did he really know that Jesus was truly innocent, being a pilgrim visiting Jerusalem during the Passover? And an unexpected assignment took place. God chose him to take up his cross. But God reminded him it is because of this expression of love. And Simon's faith was challenged that day. And I believe this when we think about Simon and how what we can learn from the cross. Simon was a man of faith, but it was challenged to another level. <coughs> because it wasn't that he was just a person of faith. Jesus was in his midst. And this cross that Jesus was going to bear for Simon, he bears for us this morning. 
So when we think about all the things that we have done in this life, Remember that God loves you in spite of the things that you have done. In spite of the things that you were doing and in spite of the things you're going to do in the future. He died for you because he loved you that much. So when we think about his expression of love, what a beautiful expression of love that God says to me, there's nothing that you think you have done or you could do that his blood cannot wash away. Amen. 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 Let's give God praise this morning.